All right, Buck, excited to have Rick with us here. Rick, thank you so much for taking some time for us. I, I guess first question is, have you had a chance to, to take a step back and decompress here uh, over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, no, we, me and my wife are getting ready to head out of town a little bit. It's uh, been a little bit overwhelming on the uh, outreach that I've gotten from a lot of people, which means a lot to me. Um, so we're going to kind of decompress here, go down and get out of the cold for a little bit and uh, come back and see what happens next. You know, Rick, you've been in the game for such a long time. Like, look, no one wants to take these uh, forced breaks, but what do you think will be some of the things that you do while you are away from it over the next few weeks or months? I, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm going to wait and, and there's some opportunities coming up. It's just, I don't know right now. You just got to take a step back and kind of relax a little bit. You've been going, you know, nine, 90 miles an hour for so long that it's uh it takes some time to say, whoa, how do I actually slow down here a little bit? So, but it's been fun, uh, you know, watching the games this weekend, uh, listening to your guys' uh, Move the Sticks <laughs> podcast, which I'm very uh, honored to be a part of uh, the program today and uh, look to give some of my insight if that'll help. And no, I, I love it. You leave me right where I want to go because I want to get your reaction. Uh, what'd you think after this first round of the playoffs? What stood out to you? You know, uh, one of the things I was looking at, I know you guys have talked about, was the uh, do you need an alert? elite quarterback or how the elite quarterbacks uh, play uh, mm -hmm. in the playoffs. And I went back and I looked at some statistical things and, you know, most of these guys are top 10 uh, from a statistical standpoint, but I think you have to go deeper into that because stats don't always tell the true story behind it. And when I looked at it and dove a little deeper, uh, Stats doesn't mean you don't you have to throw for 500 yards or throw for five touchdowns. What I've always kind of looked at was what do they do in critical situations during the game? How do they respond when it's third down? How do they keep the, the, the sticks moving? Um, when it's fourth quarter, how are they? When they're behind or ahead? Uh, it's amazing when you look at some quarterback ratings and when they're behind, and I looked at some quarterbacks that all of a sudden they start to tighten up. Mm -hmm. And then when they're ahead, they play loose and, they, and they're moving the team up and down the field. So I think when you are looking at these quarterbacks, you have to really see how they truly respond in pressure situations during the game. And most of these guys are good. And I think uh, DJ and Bucky have both referred to uh, Joe Burrow uh, mm -hmm. on the other podcast is, you know, I don't know if you call it arrogance, uh, or confident, I always looked at it as like an it factor. Yeah. And does he want the ball in his hands when the game is on the line? And there is no question that Joe Burrow definitely wants to do that. Uh, some other things I looked at through these playoffs, especially the first round, is that most of these teams have a top defense. Uh, most of the defenses are getting the offense off the field. And the time of possession is huge. And every playoff team except three, I think when you look at during the regular season, uh, won the time of possession, uh, which means above 30 minutes in the game. There are only three teams that I looked at uh, that did not win the time of possession. And that was, uh, first one was Vegas, uh, mm -hmm. who ended up losing. Uh, Philly, uh, who ended up losing down in Tampa. And the one team that didn't, have time of possession or one time of possession during the regular season was the LA Rams. But if you mm -hmm. watch that game last night, they held the ball for almost 34, 35 minutes. They the found the run game and found the run game and they were able to keep converting third downs. Uh, the other thing that I looked at too, is, you know, when you're talking about elite quarterbacks, I watched the uh, San Fran and Dallas game. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you look at all the stats and where Jimmy Garoppolo sets up, but how they won that game is was come down to that time of possession. And they were able to move the sticks. They were able to run the ball. They were able to keep Dallas's explosive offense off that field. And until we threw that interception uh, that got Dallas back into the game, they really controlled that whole game with their defense and with their run game. And having Jimmy, I think, you know, he only threw for 172 72 yards and one interception, no touchdowns but they did things to help them win the game on what he does best. 
Um, and, and like I said earlier, they controlled the, the, the clock that whole game until he got an opportunity to get back in. The other thing when I was watching that game is in the fourth quarter and is was the game management piece a little bit. Mm-hmm. And when you're watching that, first thing I was looking at was the play clock. And if you notice, every time that San Francisco was on offense in the fourth quarter, they were snapping a ball at five seconds or less on the play mm-hmm. clock, which even ate up more time, uh, which didn't give Dallas you know, a significant amount of time at the end of the game to potentially come back. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening to you there, Rick. One, so me and Bucket were talking about this before you came on. So we've made one amendment because you were talking about referencing an earlier podcast. Because we've said you kind of need one of those special quarterbacks to be able to 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 get through the tournament. I've amended that to you need a special quarterback or you need Kyle Shanahan calling your plays. <laughs> so that, that's the, that's the one amendment there uh, because I think when you look at it, Garoppolo is kind of the only exception to these really kind of premier premier dudes. Now Tennessee with Tannehill. That's a little bit, you know, that's maybe a little bit uh, in discussion. But the rest of these guys, I just feel like to make it all the way through the tournament, and maybe it doesn't even necessarily have to be the consistency of what you were referencing there of, of all the statistics. I think I referenced back kind of to the Flacco Super Bowl with the Ravens where, you know, everybody talked about Joe Flacco. How good is he? How, you know, what are his strengths and weaknesses? But he had a high ceiling, and he was able to, you know, get to that ceiling for a three- or four-game playoff stretch. I just feel like when you watch that game with New England and you see Mac Jones and you see some of the physical limitations that he has, right. Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia, some of the physical limitations he has, like maybe you can run into a playoff win here or there, but to run run through who you've got to go through that gauntlet of premier quarterbacks, man, that's tough sledding. Well, I think Bucky referred to it towards the end of the season when he was talking about Indianapolis and Carson Wentz. Yeah. And some of these teams – uh, like a San Francisco, maybe, or some of the other teams you refer to, is what I think you called it a narrow barge, a narrow margin to victory. <laughs> yeah. And they have to have the run game going. They have to have good defense. And the quarterback has to make enough plays to keep the clock moving, keep the chains moving, and, and control the game. You know, in, in thinking about that, Rick, that I think. I don't want to blow your head up, but I did listen to some of the points. I, no, 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 no. I love, I love it. I love it. It's like, great. I like that. But in thinking about that, because now we can acknowledge that it's a quarterback-driven league, but it's so hard to find the quarterback. Like, in, in th- taking all your years of experience, if you were looking for something in a college guy, what would be the two or three traits that you look for in a college prospect at quarterback? You know, when you talk about the quarterbacks, and I've made some mistakes through my career on quarterbacks, and I always thought the number one thing to look for was the intelligence part of the game. How smart are these guys? And we do a lot of different types of psychological testing, a lot of different types of intelligence testing. But what I learned, not only do you have to be smart, but you have to have mental quickness and how quickly can you process things? And the one thing that we really tried to get at, which we evolved over the last couple of years, was I can go and interview a quarterback. uh, And I interviewed many down at the combine or we had a whole program set in place on let's go out, let's visit this quarterback. Uh, The offensive coordinator is going to have a plan. He's going to install a scheme. He's going to install concepts of a passing game and pass protections. And a quarterback can sit there. We kind of watch to see if they took copious notes. And a lot of these guys went up there and talked verbatim what the coordinator said. And even sometimes sounded better than the, the coordinator that's explaining it. I was like, yeah, this guy's going to be a hell of a coach someday. <laughs> the point that I missed was that that's great. You can go up and draw that. And this safety's rolling down. And this linebacker's coming off the edge. And, you know, where's your hot reads and stuff? They can talk about it, but that's a 10 minute process. Can they do that in two and a half seconds? So we really tried to hone in and focus on not only the intelligence, but also uh, the mental quickness and how quickly they can read and respond. Because there's a lot of smart people out there. But if you can't process that in a two and a half seconds that you have, that's where that's where uh, I've saw in myself personally had some failures. I'm curious on that point because we've talked about this in years past, kind of where scouting was when when Bucky and I got started. You even precede us on that, but where it's headed and kind of what what's the next wave here? And and 
we've been kind of uh, really interested in some of the, the VR stuff that's out there. I mean, these kids put on these headsets. I think my kids have one. You put on one and they can play video games and virtual reality. But in order to gauge how somebody's processing something, how far away from that being involved in a, in, a, in a combine interview, you put the goggles on somebody, give them a look and see how fast they can see and process and, and, and be able to use that technology to aid the scouting process. Yeah, we, we started that. Uh, we started about three or four years ago. And what we actually did was use that where the technology wasn't it, where it is today, mm -hmm. but we would actually film practice from behind uh, at the quarterback eye level. So and then that film will get all woven together and you can put on the goggles and see around your 360. I mean, you can turn around and see everybody standing behind you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that got a lot of players in trouble when they weren't paying attention. To it. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Why is he picking his nose? <laughs> but so, did they find it helpful at all? Did they? Did the, the yeah, what we did was because the backup quarterback is probably not getting as many reps as he needs to get in a live practice because you're trying to get your starter ready. So uh, the backup quarterbacks would go in and take all the reps that the, that the starter did during practice, but he would do it with the goggles on. Okay. Oh, and wow. he would see the blitz like we did blitz period. So he would see the blitz period and the coach can actually see on a big screen where his eyes were going. Wow. Yeah. So all of a sudden we were able to say, well, why are you looking at over here? Your hot reads to the left instead of the right. This is where your eye should be focused. So we started to kind of delve into that. And I've always been kind of someone who wanted to think outside the box and try to get different ways. We can get maybe a competitive advantage. And especially mm -hmm. since the time limit with the new CBA that you can spend on the field with these guys through the OTAs, how much time you get with the rookies. And then, you know, once you get with training camp, get ready for the season, you're trying to get your guys ready to go. So we looked at a lot of different ways that we can potentially uh, develop that. We never got it to the point, uh, but because of COVID hitting over the last two years and the limitations on people coming in and visiting the building. But our intent was to have quarterbacks coming in for the draft that when you have them in on a top 30 that you can spend some time with them put those goggles on for seven on seven period or put those goggles on them uh during a blitz period that you had taped in training camp explain to them what the situation is what the reads are and then see how he responds and if he can do it as mentally quick as he could uh when he was trying to explain it on the board i love it now that's that's great. It, it it takes me to another thing. When I was in uh, Green Bay, I'm trying to think where you you might still might have been in Detroit or still scouting. Was whatever. that back in uh, 79, 80, Bucky? <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. It might have been. But one I of the just, things I remember you down in North Carolina when I went down and scout. Scout. He so said he I said was, you were there for the for the pro day. Were you down there for yeah, the pro I, day? I, I, yeah, I said I've been that about you, every pro day imagable. That's uh, yeah. That's so one I, of my said, I said I said things to do. Okay, let me see if I get this right. What was your job at the pro day? Were you the height weight? Were you the height weight guy? I was the probably the blesto scout back then. So I, I had the southeast uh, growing up in the scouting world. So usually the combine scouts are the ones that ran the pro day. Now they didn't have NFL Network, ESPN <laughs> it pro days. It was just, and so I didn't mind throwing a football or doing all that stuff and giving demonstrations because I. New sure to hell it wasn't going to be on TV. It wasn't even invented yet. <laughs> that is that is that is funny. But you know, on the heels of your conversation talking about identifying the quarterbacks, and then you brought the VR, the virtual reality stuff. Do you think that can foster, uh, maybe accelerate some of the development of the young quarterbacks? Because we're coming into a league where the younger guys need to play. Can we make up some of the reps by using VR? And there's such a difference in what they're doing in college. But also you're seeing a lot of the concept that these quarterbacks and the skill set that they have in college, there's the offenses at the NFL are starting to adapt to that. And, you know, the RPO game, um, you know, now defenses also have some pretty smart coaches on that side of the ball as well. So, you know, take, for example, last night game, Kyle Murray, who probably did not play one of his best games at all. Uh, and we played against both of those teams during the regular season. And Kyle Murray was able to run all over the field on us and made some explosive plays.
but he made those plays because of his ability to go out and improvise and make plays on his own, not sit back, three-step drop, read this, throw here. A lot of these quarterbacks nowadays are using their athletic skill set. Even I don't want to get into the whole another segment, but when you get yeah. into a lot of these quarterbacks uh, that are coming out this year, you're seeing a whole different style of quarterback uh, than maybe the, the, I don't want to call them the statues, but the pocket passers. Yeah. And so uh, they're putting a lot of stress on the defensive now, not only because you have to account for their arm talent, but you also have to account for their legs and how they're going to have to hurt you. Yeah, we, we, that, that's fantastic. I, I want to switch over to the defensive side of the ball while, while we've got you here because I feel like every time you go through the draft process, everybody's, you know, use comparisons. When you're in the draft room, comparisons come up with, with players. And I think you've been a part of a name that's maybe been used as a comparison more than any other, and that's Daniil Hunter. Because the production as a pass rusher wasn't really there in college, the traits were off the charts, but it was, okay, you've got to kind of, you know, you've got to, forget that rule that a lot of folks have, which is you got to have that production in order to go from one level to the next. I know Ozzy used to always bang on that. You know, we wanted to see the production in college before we brought in pass rushers. But man, you hit a home run with that kid. And it's kind of led to some of this thinking. Jason Owe is, a, is another one off this last year's draft. Odafe Owe changed his name, um, but didn't have a lot of sack production at Penn State. He transitioned beautifully uh, to the Ravens. What went into that thought process and what gave you the courage to make that pick? And, and tell us about that development process. One, it was in the third round. It wasn't in the first round. So. <laughs> <laughs> a little less risk involved. There. Yeah, yeah. But I think when you go, we have always put a point of emphasis on what can be coached and what can't be coached. And we mm -hmm. take some of these guys with the unique length, with the unique athleticism, uh, with the unique speed. Can our coaches develop the talent? Uh but what we tried to do to identify that, you better have a love and passion for the game. And you talk about football character. And these guys are so raw, um, but are they willing to put in the time and energy and effort uh, to take them to the level that they can potentially be at? Even of our, our draft class last year, as we went through those third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round type guys, we've always maybe taken a chance on guys that has some unique physical traits that our coaches fell in love with that wanted to really coach these guys and get them to their potential. But they have to want to be willing to do that. And, you know, just to go on an example, and I saw you guys talking about receivers the other day and Jamar Chase mm -hmm. and what makes him unique. Um, and, and the ability for a lot of these guys, when you look at the physical ability, I know you're looking at the speed, you're looking at the side and the clips that you showed uh, of Jamar uh, Chase catching a ball and his acceleration upfield after the catch is incredible. You know, we were able to find uh, Stefan Diggs in the fifth round uh, mm -hmm. and the way Justin Jefferson has really came on. And I think he's going to be an outstanding player in the future. They can play at their speed that they're timed at, but they can really get into and out of their cuts and they have a unique ability to not slow down. Mm -hmm. And the guys that were top picks in those earlier rounds um, that failed mm -hmm. were guys uh, that didn't have that trait. And you look at the flexibility and maybe I'm off base here, but the flexibility of being able to bend, to adjust to off target throws, to not lose mm -hmm. stride when you're doing that, to go up and make catches in, in uh, contested situations. But we try to take it a step further. So when we did all this psychological testing on these players, we actually broke down what were the emo most important psychological traits other than the physical traits on which made each position successful. And there was a lot of different combinations. So as example, a center is way different than the receiver. But a receiver, for example, the top three traits, he has to want to be coached. He has to be dedicated. And for whatever reason, what came back on all these psychological testing, and this was dated back and back tested for the past 20 years, is social maturity was a huge part of the process for receivers. And so those three things that weighted the most in besides the physical traits that we put uh, you know, weighted data or weighted the data on 
those three traits really came that those guys that had those three traits psychologically ended up being pretty successful receivers in the NFL. That's fascinating. That's fascinating to me to hear about the one wanting to be coach. We know about the determination and dedication and then the maturity, because um, I feel like the game is getting increasingly younger with the guys that are coming into the league. And so when you have a team, because we talk about turning over the team every three or four years, just based on the numbers, how do you handle all the young guys? How do you get young guys ready to play in today's environment when you don't have as much time as you used to back in the day? I think the thing that you're dealing with the most, and I know most, if you talk to most GMs around the league, is how entitled these players are coming in. Um, you know, how important is the game to them? I mean, how many of them have NIL deals? Uh, you know, the college game has totally changed. <laughs> um, the recruiting, them going into transfer portals and getting re-recruited and, and getting a lot of love out there, come, come here if it's not working out there. So there are a lot of different factors that maybe back when uh, Bucky came out and 81, 82. <laughs> I mean, one thing I knew, Bucky was going to run through a wall. No. <laughs> and he loved to play the game. Uh, but now those are the things that you have to do with whatever type of psychological testing you do, whatever type of interview process you have. And we've hired a lot of companies and a lot of companies, uh, especially from the military uh, field, um, that do this for a living on how we can identify some of these issues and especially with the way these kids are coming up today. You know, it's it's fascinating to me when you look at how you're putting the emphasis on the roster building process. Bucky's has talked about this in the past, and uh, I know we, we kind of believed in it as well when I was with Baltimore, which is kind of building up the middle. Uh, when you look at those key positions, kind of the nerve center uh, of your football team. And we you know, I always have made the comment, I think it makes more sense. And we're talking about character, kind of wrapping that together, building up the middle. The leadership positions are in the middle of the field. The further you get to the sideline, I feel like the more, maybe the more forgiving you're willing to be on on some of those things, where up the middle, that's kind of the nerve center of your team. You guys done a, a great job of that. If you look at your team and the investment that you've made uh, over a decade plus of building that up the middle, was that part of your building philosophy or is that just the way it came together? No, nothing. Hopefully it's, it's part of a philosophy that you're trying. <laughs> we, we try to spend enough time and resources to make sure we're not shooting at the hip as best we can. But uh, when, you, when you're talking about building your roster up the middle, uh, just like we referred to earlier on the quarterback, everybody from the running back, if you go down to the quarterback, the center guard, uh, the, the interior of your defensive line, the linebacker and the safety. So let's take – they have to be smart football players, but that mental quickness comes into a factor because they're playing both sides of the field. Mm -hmm. And for a running back, okay, he can use his natural speed and athletic skills. Give me the ball. And I remember, you know, when we drafted Adrian Peterson, this guy's unique. But can they – are you going to have to take them out on third down because of all the movement and adjustments that are going on the defensive side of the ball – can they identify who they have to pick up in pass protection? We talked about the quarterback, the center, making the uh, protection calls before the snap, and then how does he react after the snap? We talked about, you know, defensive ends and sometimes moving them to the interior. Well, mm -hmm. if you played at the edge all your life and all of a sudden you go in there, what we used to call in, uh, the dark hole, uh, a lot of stuff happens a lot faster because you have a guard and center right on top of you where when you're lined up outside over an offensive tackle, that's not happening as fast. And you have time to react to what's going on. And then you look at your middle linebacker and your safeties. And those guys are making all the adjustments with the flashes, the motions, everything that's going on. And things adjust not only pre-snap, but how quickly can they adjust post-snap? So everyone down that middle of your football team uh, not only has to have the physical ability, but that intelligence and that mental quickness was critical for us. The farther you away, I agree, the farther you move away from the ball, there's been a lot of corners that went to the Pro Bowl, and I'm sure are in the Hall of Fame, 
that if you put them in the briar patch, they had a, <laughs> that, may not be, that may not be their forte. But uh, we found that we didn't put as much emphasis on intelligence and mental quickness on the outside. But the closer the positions came into the ball, that's where we were really uh, trying to make that a point that we understood uh, where they were with that. You know, Rick, I, I want to ask you this, because when I was with the Carolina Panthers, uh, we went to the Super Bowl, and one of the things that we were big on, we are big on college graduates, and we are big on guys who were team captains. Uh, when you're thinking about putting together your roster, does that is that ever a consideration that, hey, we want maybe guys that have kind of been through the process and graduated and guys that were leaders on their teams? Yeah, no, because I think that speaks volumes of their maturity. It speaks volumes of probably the experience they had. But the NFL, how many guys over the last couple of years in the first round are going to fit those qualifications? Yeah. Three and, so, and out. They're all three and out. They're all they're, three and out. Yeah. Yeah. And thank God it's not basketball, one and out. Yeah. <laughs> but who knows with uh, some of these new leagues coming in right now, what their rules are going to be. Uh, but I think – you know, I, I've heard that, and most of those guys, yeah, you know they're going to be, if they've graduated and they've been team captains and they're playing, you know they love the game, uh, even though they're on full scholarship and they're playing at a lot of major programs. But I think nowadays, you know, some of those guys are getting pushed down out of the first round just because of the excitement of, man, look at this phenomenal junior. Mm -hmm. And he's only 21 years old. Look at his growth potential compared to a 24-year-old. How high is his ceiling compared mm -hmm. to the young guy? So I think those are the things that you try to weigh in. And again, with all the other ancillary testing and analytics that we used, we tried to identify a lot of that to help us make the best decisions possible. I want to ask you an offensive line question from a from a building standpoint. I was talking to a GM the other day, and we were kind of discussing, you know, kind of how the Chiefs revamped their offensive line in this last year, and they were able to do it with with two draft picks with with Humphrey and, and Trey Smith, and then they go out and pay big money for Joe Tooney. Um, and we were discussing: Would you rather have when you're putting your roster together now with the way the game is that that rock solid firm interior with those three guys? You know, it used to be forever. We talked about the premium being at the tackle position, but almost seems like Rick now there's more emphasis placed on really trying to be rock solid with your interior, maybe more so than we have in years past. Especially if you have an immobile quarterback, because those yeah. guys cannot get collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if a quarterback has to step up to throw the ball. Uh, and you see, you know, some of these athletic quarterbacks that can make up for that. But I think it depends on the philosophy of your team. We relied a lot on what our philosophy and what our system is on offense. Mm -hmm. And I know when we changed uh, and when uh, Gary Kubiak came in, we wanted to run some of that scheme. It was a whole different philosophy on the type of offensive lineman that you wanted. You got to be able to really move, right? So those guys got to be able to move laterally. They almost run like tight ends. Uh, but if you're going to, you want to run some outside zone scheme, how do they do at the second level, uh, how they sustain in space, uh, what they do out on screens. That was all extremely important to us. So our guys uh, were not as big, but they mm. were all tremendous athletes, and they all were very smart off the intelligence side of it. And when you try to do things that don't fit the scheme, that's when you kind of get in disarray. So if you are an outside zone scheme and some of the stuff, and all of a sudden you want to try to start doing gap scheme stuff, yeah and trying to plow guys forward, those guys aren't built to do that. Mm -hmm. Or you want to do one-on-one -on -one and pass rushes, which you can't always avoid, but your protections, are they based off play actions and everything you do? Uh, but if you're going to sit there and try to go toe-to-toe, one-on-one with, with some of these power rushers, physically, they just can't do that, but we did not draft them to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's trying to find a balance of of what fits the scheme you're trying to run but you also do not want to pass up good football players too but we had our coaches heavily involved on uh, when we were talking about personnel i mean our scouts uh did a phenomenal job and our, our directors and when george was there george payton and we can tell you what the player is mm -hmm. but the coaches have to come in and say 
well, he's not going to be able to do this because it doesn't fit our scheme. So you have to rely on that because if he's going to be what we call, you know, a, a, a red player, which is a solid starter in a league or a blue player, an elite player in a league, if you don't marry him up to the right scheme, then he's probably not going to play at that level because physically he can't do some of the things you're asking him to do. So it's a very fine balance on taking best players, but also trying to marry it up with the coaches want to do from a schematic standpoint. Rick, you saying that, I think a lot of people listening to it, that will now see the challenge that the general manager has, right? Because the coach has a lot of power based on the scheme that they want to play. But sometimes you guys are judged on picking players to play a scheme that, I don't know, may not last to, to the end of time, depending on how long the coach stays, the offensive coordinator stays. So right. as, the, as the general manager, how do you balance that? That's, because that's yeah, that's that's long term. Yeah, that's that's a tough part of the job, because if you're going to I think we went through maybe six different offensive coordinators uh, mm -hmm. during the Coach Zimmer's era. Mm -hmm. So it was constantly it's like a moving target all the time. So you try <laughs> to do your best to adapt. And the guys that we do have, can they can you do some things from your scheme to maybe adjust a little bit to their skill set? Um, but when you have the coaching turnover that it is. Uh, and you're always trying to marry up the personnel to the scheme. Are there ways that some of these coaches and you see some of them doing some things that, Hey, I have to adjust my scheme to what the players can do some as well. And some coaches are just, you know, this is what we run and this is what we have to have. And if they don't fit this, then I don't want them. Some coaches and just listening through a lot of coaching interviews and things like that. I can do this with this player. And I know we can potentially adjust our scheme to fit what he does best, whether that's, you know, a dime linebacker, you know, uh, Simmons, who we watched last night, trying yeah. to figure you know, the kid that came out of Clemson, uh, you know, the kid that came out of uh, Southern Illinois that I think Carolina Chin, does a yeah. job using his skill set uh, to what he does best. Now, what I thought in the draft and whether I was right or wrong, if you're going to have him play deep safety and try to go silent, that's not what his skill set is. But mm -hmm. the way they utilize him, the way he comes down flying in the box, the things that he can do and match up with tight ends because of his size, uh, I thought that Carolina – and Carolina had a great defense this year uh, when we played against them. Um, but they did a very good job, I thought, matching up skill sets – uh, to what their players uh, had. I think it's interesting. It's fascinating when you look at how it's done differently. I, I remember in Baltimore when Rex was there running the defense, it was kind of just get whatever shape, size, just get really tough, instinctive, aggressive, fast football players, and we'll figure it out. He's like, I'll play with three safeties. I'll play whatever we need to do. We'll get our best 11 on the field. I go to Cleveland, and it's Romeo Cornell, and it's the Patriot way, and it's like right. every – Every, everybody on the edge got to look like Willie McGinnis. I'm like, we can't, we, there's no, not many of those guys around. Like you had to fit all the specs for everything they were looking for, but it's two totally different ways of, of building a roster. Uh, when you're interviewing coaches, you've been through that. You've gone through that cycle as a bunch of teams are doing now. Um, how much of that do you get into in terms of the, the flexibility or, or the fixed, uh, what they're looking for? Yeah, there's a lot of things from uh, during those coaching interviews. And I know everybody uh, has their different ways of, of trying to identify who their next head coach is. But the one thing is I always want to know is how familiar were they with with our current personnel? Mm -hmm. um, are any of these well, guys? Well, let me let me stop you right there. Has anybody ever come in on a coaching interview and not been familiar with the roster for the team they were interviewing for? No, then that, then we're interviewing the wrong guy. <laughs> uh, my fault. Good luck. In, uh, <laughs> but I, these coaches, they got, you know, with the rules and the hiring process right now. I mean, how many of these guys that weren't able to interview uh, the first week, but now all these guys that won in the in the in the wild card are trying to prepare for four or five different interviews. It's impossible to know the yeah. roster inside now. You know, you can give unless you, you know, potentially played with a team. Uh, yeah. I know we always try to help any of our coaches that were on the head coaching interviews. Uh, we always had them meet with our pro personnel department uh, to go through everything from A to Z on 
how we had the players graded and where we saw them, uh, then he had some time, you know, he's not going to have time to sit there and evaluate every guy on that roster, yeah. but at least he can get a feel for what's going on. Um, but no, I can honestly say there was uh, no head coach or any interview I said in that I, I wish I could tell you something about your roster, Rick, but I can't. As of now. <laughs> <laughs> and Rick, in, in thinking about that, because you have hired uh, coaches, what would be a couple of the traits that you look for in a head coach? What do you believe now that you've gone through it? What, what's important for a coach? I think it depends on your situation. Um, you know, every team is different. Um, you know, do you, do you hire, you know, from an ownership standpoint, are you hiring guys that, okay, I want an offensive young minded coach or are you uh, I think nowadays the head coach in that quarterback relationship, and it's probably always been is extremely important. Um, but you have to analyze your team and what type of coach you think your team needs, because it may fit for another team, uh, but it doesn't fit for you. So one of the things that I did through the process was I interviewed 46 of our players, uh, and asked if you were going to hire a head coach, what were the traits that you were going to look for? And during the time that we hired Coach Zim, one of the things that really stuck out the most was that our players wanted to be held accountable both on and off the field. And Zim was mm. a perfect fit for us at the time. But that night, night might not be the same for any every team. Uh, every team has different per personalities with their players. Some teams have older vet rosters. Other teams have, okay, we're starting from scratch. We just started this. We're in a young uh, roster mode. So I think you really – have to understand where your team is, what your team needs, and then what coach doesn't mean he's not going to be successful somewhere else. It's like, you know, we were just talking about players. Do they fit? Uh, because if they fit your scheme, they're going to be pro bowlers or very good starters in this league. If they're not, they're going to play at a lower level than that. I think that goes the same way uh, when you're going through this coaching process. Just a couple more. You've been super generous with your time, Rick. We really appreciate it. Not like um, I have anything going on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, this is your restful period, man. This is just your restful period. I, I, I love talking ball, though. <laughs> We're digging into you here. Um, I don't know if, if you've had a chance, obviously, with all, all the responsibilities of a general manager. I don't know how, how much opportunity you've had to look at some of these guys coming up in this next draft class. But is there anybody that you, maybe you, you've watched early on here that, that you really loved in this group? Yeah, I got an opportunity to go out. Uh, my mental health reprieve was going out on Fridays and Saturdays to college games oh, nice. uh, to go out. Uh, usually at the end of the week was when I started to do tape work on the college kids just to, to see. So the thing that I think is going to be very interesting is going to be this quarterback class. Yeah. Uh, and I had an opportunity to see most of them play live. A couple of them I didn't, but when whoever I think uh, uh, whoever who's who's covering the senior bowl, I thought is that you? Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. got that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yep. That's going to be a interesting process through this whole draft because yeah. there is no clear cut number one right now. Um, and what was encouraging to see is that every one of those guys that were eligible to play in the senior bowl are going to show up. Yep. So that jockey in for position is going to be fascinating to watch as we go through this process. And it's going to start down at the senior bowl and it's going to continue through the combine and then through all these private workouts. Uh, and you're going to see some guys start to go up and down uh, because you can evaluate the tape. Uh, you can get the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but when you get an opportunity to start stacking these guys and not one of them, I think, backed out of that competition, yeah. uh, it'll be interesting to see how many throw at the combine and things like that. Like there always is. But I don't know if there is a Joe Burrow in this class. Now, maybe there's going to be three years from now. And you're going to say, wow, he should have went first overall pick. Who, who knows mm -hmm. that yet? But this will be one of the more fascinating draft classes at quarterback because someone's going to be good. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see how all these guys stack up against each other as we go through this process. You know, Rick, um, I'm always been curious about the general manager that goes out on the road and does the college work, like going. 
what is it that you gain as a general manager when you go and you see these guys live? Because a lot of our listeners don't understand, like, what's the difference in terms of studying the tape as opposed to going to a game and having a chance to see a guy up close and personal? One, you can see a lot of things that you can't see on the tape. Uh, I've been to, I love going to the pregame. Uh, mm -hmm. I love just seeing uh, their swagger when they come out. Uh, uh, one of the quarterbacks, I won't, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. save that for another time, um, <laughs> that was incredible was I was at a game and uh, the fans, uh, the, the student section was chanting, overrated, overrated. Yeah. And he chimed in and started doing. <laughs> oh, back. I was like, I love that kid's personality and that kid's fire. Yeah. Um, but the other things you can see is, you know, and especially if you're watching the quarterbacks uh, is how are they, who are they interacting with on the sideline? Mm -hmm. Are they talking, who are they talking to? Did he go over and talk to his offensive line? Matt Ryan was the best I've ever seen. I went and watched Marcus Russell workout. That was an incredible workout. Uh, and Matt Ryan's. And if you just looked at the two physically throwing a football, there wasn't a comparison. But I would never forget the night I was at a rainy night when Boston College played at Virginia Tech. Matt Ryan had a good football team, but he made that football team better because of who he was. And I've never seen a quarterback at the college level go down after every series and talk to each offensive group. After he got off the headsets with whatever coach he was talking with upstairs, after they went through the pitchers or everything that they were doing, then he took the time to go and talk to everyone. And you can tell those guys really loved and wanted to play for him. And the effort and energy they gave on that, that night, I believe they ended up beating Virginia Tech that night when Virginia Tech was rolling in the storm and in the rain, was incredible to watch. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've seen a, a, a defensive player come out and wouldn't even warm up with his position group. Um, mm. He was totally isolated by himself. Uh, and he had all the talent in the world to be one of the best at his position and end up uh, fizzling out here at the NFL. So those type of things that you can't see on tape, I can see you know, all the things, the traits that we're looking for and this and that, but to actually put your eyes on them, to see how they interact, to see how they are pregame, even after postgame, are they, you know, how are they acting after postgame? How do they respond if they have a, 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 a poor game and the next day, uh, you know, how, how, are, how, how they respond the next week. So there are a lot of different things that you can see uh, that you can't see when you're actually watching the tape. You know, it's outstanding. I've, I've told Bucky the story a bunch about two quarterbacks that uh, I would go down and, and just try and mirror them. I wouldn't wear team gear and would go down there and just kind of mirror them on the sideline, just kind of walk because I want to just follow them around for the whole game. And these two guys, uh, it was bad. Let's just put it that way. I'll, I'll tell you who they were later off the air, but it was bad. And it was they were both first round picks and they were both ginormous busts. But it was the tape was great, but then the exposure right. of being at the game and being able to mirror them and just follow them around the whole game was very valuable. As Paul Harvey said, and then there's the rest of the story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, last one from me, Rick. And again, I, we can't thank you enough. This has been so much fun. Um, I, I would love to know, after all this experience that you have now, what advice you would give to first-year general manager Rick Spielman about, you know, how, how to, how to handle this job he's getting ready to get into. I think it's changed and it's changed over the um, past three or even four years on all the other things that you have to deal with. And the thing that I always uh, would tell young people coming in is you don't have to have all the answers or act like, you know, everything you're going to have to learn and grow in the job as well. And don't be afraid to make a mistake. If you do make a mistake, you know, you own that mistake, uh, you know, praise others, not yourself for when things go well, but it, it's patience and it's learning. And even this year, as much, I learned something every day uh, mm -hmm. in handling a, a situation off the field and handling a coach and handling something that's happening in a training room. You nowadays spend so much time 
uh, dealing with other things in the building, how you're bridging everything with the business side. Uh, you know, how are you monitoring what's going out uh, now with all the social media uh, and what your team's putting out? Are you giving uh, the opponent any type of competitive advantage? There is a whole litany of things that you have to deal with just besides personnel. And that's why you have to have great people. And the one thing that I always try to do is surround myself with a lot smarter people than I was. So analytics, I don't care how you do your algorithm. You can stand on your head and spit wood nickels for all I care. <laughs> this is the result I want. And it's up to you to go about whatever way you're going to do it, go yeah. ahead and do it to get the result. But you have to really put together a team that you can really, really rely and trust on and let them do their jobs. And I was very fortunate uh, with the Vikings that we had a great team, a great cap guy, great sports medicine, great analytics, uh, great mental health team that we put together, uh, a great uh, scouting staff, uh, you know, privilege that me and George were together for so long, over 20 plus years that we worked together. And when you can put together a team like that, it gives you the flexibility to manage other things. And then get out on the weekend and get your mental health break so you can actually. Do <laughs> hey, this has been so much fun, Rick. We can't thank you enough. Hopefully, we can turn around and do this again soon. Go get yourself a little bit of a breath. Go get yourself yeah. a little break, uh, a little family time, and then we got to get you back on, man. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed the uh, being on with you guys and and anything you need. Like I said, I don't got much going on in life right now. Just trying to recharge. But any Eddie, I don't know if you call it wisdom, but anything I can share to give some insight, uh, I, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.